So the next talk uh, is by Robert Blum, The Promise of Co-Packaged Optics, Paving the Way for Improved Power Efficiency Cost. Uh, and uh, Robert is a general manager of the new business and senior director of marketing for Intel Silicon Photonics Division. And before that, he was at Aclaro and, and other companies. But he's a world, world leader in uh, photonic integration. He has lots of products he's put out. So Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Everything okay with the slides? Can you hear me okay? They look perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So here's my version of the data growth chart, right? And oops, did it go away? Yeah. Um, so as you know, you know, data is growing exponentially, which is all exciting for us. Uh, Raj showed the data on the right in a better plot. I need to steal it from him, which went all the way to, I think, 2032, showing not just hundred zettabytes uh, created worldwide, but uh, uh, 1,000 zettabytes created worldwide by uh, 10 years later. So I mean, this, is, this is very exciting. And only a small portion of the data is really analyzed today, right? And that is what make it, makes it to the data center. Um, that's on the, on the left chart, the data center to user traffic. It's about three zettabytes per year or so. And there's, as we have heard from Catherine as well, much more traffic inside the data center then there is a traffic to and from the data center. The ratio here on this chart is about 6x. I think Catherine mentioned the 25x for, for Facebook data centers. So obviously lots of uh, strain onto the network, lots of um, data that needs to be, be processed and analyzed in the data center, duplicated uh, and, um, and so forth. So um, here's also my version of the CLAW, CLAW's topology. Um, at the bottom, we have racks of servers or storage, right? I've also shown the accelerator pools uh, on the left. So again, these can be uh, GPU, other accelerators for AI machine learning applications, for example. Um, and, uh, or it could be also uh, dedicated memory for, uh, memory, for example, right? Um, what we see now is really this, this tiered architecture. Uh, and we see more and more of these, these tiers happening, uh, not just three levels, could be many more levels. And so if you look at the ratio of switches to, uh, to servers, uh, it actually increases to quite, quite significant levels. And we have seen um, uh, over the years really the, the importance and the relevance of networking increase uh, dramatically um, because of these, these new workloads, because of general purpose compute applications. Um, and um, and uh, as Catherine, for example, mentioned as well, you know, they've deployed single mode fiber and many of the, the large data centers have deployed uh, single mode fiber throughout the data center. So if you walked into a data center, a large data center today, you would typically see 25 gig servers connected to top of rack switches. And at that point you have 100 gig single mode fiber uh, deployed you know, throughout really the, uh, the different tiers of, of, of the network. I'm gonna talk about also the, the migration now as we're moving to 200 and 400 gig uh, this year and next year. Uh, and then obviously talk about co-packaged optics uh, for, for the generations after that. What is important obviously for us also at Intel is that it's not just about uh, the servers or the storage, it's also about the NICs, it's about the ethernet and it's about the connectivity in between. Um, so uh, that's why, why we are part of the connectivity group which includes now Barefoot Networks as well as our NIC cards and obviously Silicon Photonics because end-to-end -end optimization, software, all of that uh, is, is becoming more and more important. Uh, this will be very familiar to you, obviously. So, you know, we have really, by bringing signal photonics to the optics industry, it has really transformed the industry to a high volume uh, manufacturing uh, mindset. Uh, and also for, for us at Intel, <laughs> bringing optics to, to Intel, uh, it was quite interesting to see sort of the, um, the, the different mindsets were of, of obviously for, for, uh, for Intel, making everything at wafer level and then CMOS is, uh, is obviously uh, a table stakes. And so it's, it's, it's great to leverage all of the know-how to, to make optics. I think one thing that I wanna highlight is that it's not just about the lasers. Uh, it's also for us obviously to be able to put SOAs uh, onto, onto the, 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 the same platform um, for, for a lot of other applications, including a coherent or for sensing, this is, this is a key enabler, obviously also photo detectors. Um, we can put multiple wavelengths on the, on the same die. And on the right thing, I want to highlight it that we don't just do full optical electrical testing, but we also do wafer level burning. And so this is really key when we look at our reliability, our track record is really the ability to test at the wafer level, burn at the wafer level and so on. So over the past four years, when we went into production in late 2016 and 2017, 
We have now shipped more than 4 million of these 100 gig transceiver modules. We're shipping about two per year now. Uh, there's both a PSM4 on the left where you have four parallel fibers carrying 25 gig each to get you 100 gig for transmit and the same for receive. Um, the kind of more exciting part, at least for me, is the CWDM4 on the right. It's also our highest volume runner. So there you have four different lasers, uh, four different wavelengths, uh, all on the same chip. Four mass and modulators, optical multiplexer, again, part of the same transmitter chip. Then you just need one fiber and you can go to two kilometers or even 10 kilometers. Um, when you open up the module, this is what it looks uh, inside. And um, for those of us who have done optical transceivers uh, for, for, for many years, uh, you will remember that, uh, or when you use discrete optics, actually, even today, when you open it up, uh, it will be filled with a TOSA and a ROSA, right? A tra transmitter optical subassembly, receiver optical uh, subassembly, essentially large gold boxes that are hermetically sealed. Uh, we need none of that. I keep joking that when you open it up, the, what, what's in the transceiver is mostly air. Uh, we put the uh, semiphotonics chip uh, directly onto the PCBA. Uh, and here you see the, the picture at the bottom of the transceiver. I don't know if I have my cursor here. I'm not kind of low on time, but maybe I'll try to show it here. So uh, four lasers here, uh, modulators. And we actually flip chip bond the, the driver for the modulators directly on top. It's a segmented uh, mass center modulator, so it's a tightly coupled interface. We have the drive which I see directly on top of that, and then the optical multiplexer. So this is sort of a was almost like a precursor for what we're going to be showing next. Is really this 3D integration, uh, doing much more complex assemblies, um, taking advantage of advanced packaging technologies that are really needed for these uh, future generations. But this was sort of a first uh, first time where we where we we did this type coupling. Uh, the other thing I would like to point out is uh, the last bullet on the, the right. Uh, it's really uh, industry leading reliability. Our lasers have a, a fit of about two uh, and the entire module has a DPM of 30. So this is the whole transceiver assembly. So again, this is uh, one to two orders of magnitudes better than what um, we're typically seen in the industry. Um, I, I think one of the benefits of doing it, uh, everything in photonics is that the registration, the accuracy of everything you're doing is much, the distribution is much tighter than you would see with discrete optics. So for example, here, we were able to do uh, a CWDM4 version for, uh, for outdoor, for 5G applications, which is uncooled from minus 40 to 85C, um, using essentially the entire CWDM4 grid uh, um, for uh, using, uh, using up that entire CW4 grid, not for process variations, but for the temperature range, right? So that, that was a big, uh, big advantage, for example, that we have with, with the tight process control. Uh, 400 gig now is, uh, is now starting to ramp uh, to at least some of the data centers as is uh, 200 gig uh, FR4. Um, and so that now uh, moves from 25 gig electrical on the left-hand side to 50 gig PAM4 electrical. So you have eight lanes of 50 gig on the electrical side to get your get you 400 into those QSF PDDs. And then on the transmit side, again, the, the PSM4 equivalent here is this DR4. We have four lasers, four modulators, each carrying 100 gig. So we're moving from 25 uh, gig to 100 gig by, by doubling the, uh, the baud rate and also going to PAM4 modulation. So this is kind of the first uh, manifestation of uh, 400 gig. And then obviously, and this is a slide uh, that really I have shown uh, since I joined Intel, you know, four, four and a half, five years ago, from the very beginning, because this was has always been our vision, right? It was about pluggable modules, moving to really the uh, the optical I/O, the optical integration. Um, that's uh, at a at a fundamental level is that's why we're really uh, investing into this the space and into the future is really to enable this uh, uh, this integration because we know that obviously today the 100 gig CWM4 modules. Yes, we have a fundamentally different cost structures, but it's it's multi-source and there are multiple suppliers. Uh, and and obviously, yes, today we have a lot of advantages due to better reliability and 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 and, and, and testing and so on. Uh, but the and, and so ability to scale and do do high volume, right? But uh, ultimately, uh, when you look in, into the core package, that's something that really you can only do with silicon photonics, right? And you know, we've always known that there's going to be this 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 brick wall that that you're going to hit. And then you you need to integrate, right? And that's why today we have obviously the the switch ASIC in house, and we also have the photonics in house, and we're trying to drive the industry to really uh, adopt that and uh, work with with the partners. And so uh, back in uh, in March we did the first demonstration of the the Ethernet uh, co packaged optical switch, and there's a link here to the press release where you have several pictures and some more details. And I'm gonna 
talk about that obviously uh, on the next few slides as well. But you know, just to kind of explain why we need it, right? I mean, we've talked about this data center traffic doubling uh, about every two years. It's maybe less for the smaller data centers, but for the large data centers, what we're seeing is two, two and a half years. Uh, Catherine also mentioned the doubling of bandwidth that they're seeing in Facebook's data center. Obviously the, the switch uh, I see needs to keep up with that. And then the optics is keeping up with that, right? So we need to basically double the um, the bandwidth from uh, the baud rate, the bandwidth from 100 gig to 200 gig to now 400 gig over the course of uh, four years. But the 30 speeds, you know, they are not keeping up. The electrical speeds are not keeping up. We're only getting now, even if we went from 100 gig optical to 400 gig optical, but the 30 speeds speed only went from 25 to 50 gig, right? And that means you need more IO uh, ports, more electrical pins to get uh, to your uh, switch ASIC. Um, and basically you are running out of bandwidth uh, escape, right? So you need to you know, need to change something. The other thing is that obviously as the service speed goes up, your reach decreases, your, your power goes up. Uh, and by being able to integrate the optics and electronics together, you're able to reduce the total uh, power. And so what we're doing, um, again, I'm going, not going to do, go into much, a lot of details here, but we're obviously integrating the lasers with the, um, um, with the switch silicon and, and the, the silicon photonics all on the same chip. And it gives us uh, higher, better power savings than if you had the discrete lasers separately. And, um, and one of the things obviously is, uh, one of the concerns is obviously reliability when you make these very highly complex assemblies. And so what we have done here, and this is shown in this 1.6 terabit uh, photonic engine that we did for this integration is we have integrated um, let me actually step back for a second. So on this 1.6 terabit engine, we have four DR4 interfaces, right? So we have uh, four ports, four times four ports, basically four times 400 gig. So that would need 16 lasers. But what we've actually done here, this is in the middle of the chip where it says one here, we have actually uh, implemented um, redundant lasers, two lasers uh, for each port so that we have, if one of the lasers is degrading or something, we can switch over. And that radically changes your reliability calculation. We then have a, a, an array of switches, so one by two, so we can switch lasers over. We have uh, 16 micro ring resonators so instead of mass sender uh, modulators that are long, we have ring resonators. And then we route to the right side, we have mode converters, we have V groups, and we can do fully passive alignments. So this is a 1.6 terabit switch, the uh, 1.6 terabit uh, engine that we use for this uh, core package demo. And um, and there's a lot more detail if you want to look it up. So uh, Ling, uh, our fellow, gave a talk at uh, Hot Interconnect earlier this year, and then also Ken Brown, who is our senior director of packaging. Um, he just gave a talk, was it last week, maybe two weeks ago, at Semicon Taiwan, where he talked a lot about the 3D packaging that that we've done, and he has a lot more photos and pictures that uh, you know, like the one on the right, but in more detail. So if you're interested, uh, please look up his talk. But basically we have a 1.6 photonic engine. If you compare it to the 100 gig uh, pluggable module, it's obviously much, much smaller, uh, much higher band bandwidth density and also um, um, much, much lower in power. And by using that really, uh, we're able to get about 30% of uh, um, energy improvement, energy efficiency improvement, not, not at the photonic level, but at the switch level, right? So the switch overall is actually using 30% less um, power than, um, than it would uh, if it was using pluggable modules, right? And so what we have done here is under this uh, cover, we have uh, four uh, 1.6 terabit photonic engines. And actually each one has, you see these heat pipes, um, has this old individual uh, heat cooling. So this heatsink on the left cools two of those engines. This one cools two of those. And then there was a big heatsink on top of this, which was cooling the 12.8 terabit switch ASIC, uh, which we had to remove for the picture. Um, and we have half the ports optically enabled, half the ports went uh, with DAC cables, copper cables to, uh, to the front face plate, right? And uh, that was for us at 12.8 terabit, really it was a proof of concept to show um, that it can be done, also apply the learnings. So this was really designed for 25T and for, um, uh, and also for future 50 t uh, switch generations based on 100 gig 30s, right? So maybe one slide on pluggables and I'm gonna go back into what we expect the timing to be for core package optics. So obviously, you know, when, when we first started talking about, um, about uh, go, going to core package optics, going to switch, integrated switch, it wasn't quite clear whether even 400 gig could be done in a, a pluggable form factor. You know, there were a lot of debates around 12 watts, 15 watts, what can you do? 
now it's pretty clear, obviously, 400 gig is happening uh, now. Uh, but even 800 gig, there's industry consensus that at 800 gig, uh, there will, and at 100 gig 30s, there will be uh, pluggable modules. Um, so we see that happening over the next uh, um, basically one and a half switch generations, uh, if you will, even though the initial de deployments are all two times 400 gig, right? But, uh, you know, 100 gig uh, 30s will enable 800 gig uh, pluggable modules. But you have quite some significant uh, um, compromises that you need to um, to live with. And so if we look at um, the, the, the progression really, so the vertical axis is switch bandwidth versus time. Um, and uh, you have a few boxes here. So again, 12.8 uh, switch, 12.8 T switches use 50 gig 30s, 256 electrical ports, and you, you have 32 pluggable modules at, at, uh, at 400 gig, right? And you can do that in a one RU form factor. At, um, I think there's a build here. At 25T, you, you could do 32 times 800, but you will really need retimers on the boards. And again, retimers cost you power. Also, the, if you look at the whole thermal solution, if you look at the cooling solution, it's really far from ideal because, you know, you really, um, I mean, you cannot do what I showed you earlier with those heat, heat pipes. Uh, this is a very efficient cooling with, you know, optimized for the, 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 1.6 T engine in that, that example. For pluggable modules, the cooling efficiencies are, are much, much worse. And you're basically getting the heat uh, from the pluggable modules onto the switch ASIC or vice versa. So that really makes your heart, your life much harder. Um, a 50 T, it's, it's the same thing. You would have to go to two RU with those 800 gig pluggable plug modules. And again, at that point, you're really comparing those pluggable modules to, um, to the core package switch. And it's not just 30% lower power, it's also when we estimated it's about 30% lower cost for the integrated switch, right? So obviously there's there's some supply challenges and other uh, trade-offs and because the convenience of having pluggable modules and the serviceability um, uh, go away, and, but they are traded again for significant uh, technical benefits and also uh, uh, cost benefits. And at 100T really, it's very clear the pluggable module is broken. And the question is, you know, how can you do that? Basically, it's clear you have to do co-packaging, uh, in our opinion. And um, it might be 100 gig 30s. It could also be 200 gig 30s. Again, there is some some discussion in the industry. So, you know, we did the pilot. Uh, we did we did the 12.80 demonstration. We'll do uh, expect to do a pilot at 25T to learn and refine. And then the first full-scale deployments would really be at 50T switches switch switching. And then we expect co-package optics to really be ubiquitous, and fundamentally enabling at 100 T. And then sort of a new roadmap slide really, um, you know, so on the left, you see what's, what we're doing today, 100 gig to 400 gig pluggables. We did the core package demo uh, in the middle. I'm showing you some, some uh, bandwidth here. So we expect for, for the core package optics, maybe we're not going to use a 1.6 T engine. We would use a 3.2 terabit uh, engine. Um, we can get between 50 and 100 gigabits per second per millimeter. That's really this, this, this shoreline a bandwidth density is kind of a key figure of merit and less than 20 picojoules per bit. Uh, obviously, we have to be Ethernet standard or MSA compliant on the optical interface, right? In the future, really, and again, this is, if you look at, you know, why we're truly doing this, why we, why obviously, uh, companies like uh, Intel and many others have, are investing in optics. It's really uh, enabling not just uh, uh, Ethernet switching, but a lot of other uh, 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 silicon, including uh, XPUs, essentially. Um, there we're looking at another factor of about 10 for improved uh, bandwidth density per show line. So 500 to one terabits per millimeter, lower energy efficiency, because now we uh, don't have to uh, comply with some of these overheads that come with, um, with some of the files that, uh, that, that you need to do to be interoperable uh, with other vendors and really a, a very tight uh, integration, right? So again, um, not putting any timelines uh, onto this or being more specific, but obviously it's, it's very clear that that, um, that is going to be the future. So again, here's some, some, some new pictures for you at the bottom and you, this is actually, uh, this was powered up and then we took it off. Um, oh, it was powered on the right, um, but obviously we cannot power it on when the, when the lid is off. Um, and you can also see this, this thermal, by the way, you, you see all the openings in the front. So you just imagine the thermal efficiencies of cooling this is, it's much easier to get air through this than it would be if this was all uh, shut with uh, pluggable modules, right? But um, we're really, it's a very mature technology, high volume, couple million units per year. Um, we expect 800 gig to, four, to, to ramp early in 22, 
start wrapping in, in 22. This year, next year is going to be all about uh, 200 gig and 400 gig in the next year. Um, the integration with Siem, uh, gives really clear scale performance and uh, reliability advantages. Uh, we have the advantages already today by using silicon photonics over discrete optics. Um, and I mentioned you can use pluggables if you want, but uh, again, core packaging will be re required eventually. So you might as well get started uh, sooner than later. I think that's all I had today. I'm just trying to make up some time from Dan, but I didn't quite manage to do that. <laughs> that was great, Robert. Very, very nice talk. Very impressive results. Um, any questions from the panelists or from uh, the audience? Please type in the chat. Um, what, one thought I had, you showed very impressive reliability results. And obviously as we go to you know, 25 and 50 terabit and you've got 32 lasers on there, that yep. becomes really important. How much advantage are you seeing from the fact that it's integrated? You know, if you had a separate laser with a separate fiber that has a certain failure rate and, and such, are you seeing an advantage of integration in terms of that performance? Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, we, we, we do see an advantage uh, because you, you can actually operate it at lower power when you integrate because you don't have those coupling losses, right? Um, and also we have the ability to put the uh, redundancy on there. So once you put the redundancy on, uh, it really eliminates, uh, I mean, it, it, it goes down in orders of magnitude, right? So you can now tolerate single failures, single point of failures, and that really gives you a big, big, big advantage, right? And so it's, it's kind of simple, simple math on your, on your failure rates. Other questions? I've got a few. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so thanks, Robert. Really good talk. So much good stuff there. Um, I would thanks. say uh, you kind of brought it up at the end. I'm curious when you think, if you think uh, the sort of uh, compliance with MSAs and uh, signaling standards, connectivity standards starts to go away, is that in data center applications or is just that just when you get to XPU? Yes, obviously, if you control, uh, if, if you control the link, uh, if you control both sides of the link, you can obviously um, uh, do, do what, what is best for, for the, the power dissipation, right? And, um, but obviously, in the, in the data center, as you go across longer distances, uh, you know, hundreds of meters, kilo, kilometers, you, you want to have the um, interoperability with, with other vendors, also, you know, backwards compatibility, for example, um, with... with um, um, with other standard switches that are not core packaged. So I think we'll always, these applications will, will always require um, compliance with the MSA and um, you know, Ethernet standards on, on, the optical, on the optical link. In fact, actually what we did for this core package demo in, in March, we actually had it to talk to a different vendor switch with a, just a generic DR4 module plugged in to, to, to show that they can talk to each other. And that was actually a lot of work to, to make that work, but this, that's why you have all these plug fests and the interoperability testings to ensure that you can interoperate with the multiple vendors can interoperate. And in any case, we wouldn't be doing this alone, right? That's, you know, we, you know Catherine talked about the CPO initi initiative in Facebook, Microsoft, obviously there's other suppliers, Alexis is, is, is on from, from Broadcom. So obviously this is something that, that multiple people need to embrace and, and, uh, and are embracing to really make, make happen. So we'll have interoperability at that, that case, at that, that level. But once you go really shorter distances and you control the whole box, then obviously uh, you know, some of the constraints go away and then you can um, increase your power efficiency. Yeah, one, uh, one other question tied to that. When you're sort of an IDM that does silicon photonics and the, um, the XPU and the packaging, um, and you mentioned CERTI is going to 100G or maybe even 200G, uh, when you control that whole ecosystem, do you start to think about that differently and scale back on CERTI's rates and go wide and parallel? Or do you think that you let you know, the, the, the silicon decide what to do and then you adapt as a photonics chiplet? I, I think you have, uh, you, you have both, right? I mean, you, when, you, when you do the co-packaging, um, already today, you know, EMIP, for example, you, uh, and other COBOS, you already have... Uh, wide parallel interfaces, right? And you will you need that for, for this type of core packaging. Um, th then the question becomes, do you need to talk to the outside world? If you do, then you will need to do the 30s and then the FIs. If you control everything, yeah, you might you might stay wide and parallel, but again, wide and parallel only 
um, works for certain. I mean, I, I mean the, the, the again, it kind of depends on how 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 far do you want to go, and um, and again, there's there's benefits if you can put it together or to if you can multiplex things, and then even if you go just a few centimeters or a couple of meters to to maybe do some conversion, right? So it kind of depends, but yeah, if you control both, it, it, you, you might not have to use you know, the traditional 30s, uh, but again, um, you, you have to look at your bandwidth escape, number of pins, can you get your data in and out? And fundamentally, a lot of the challenges we're seeing is gonna be around, you know, there's just tremendous amounts of data, terabytes of data that need to get in and out of chips. And um, um, you, at some point you're just running out of um, out of pins to get, get them in, even, even in some of these other wide and parallel interfaces. Robert, there's one more question from the audience from IR yeah. Labs. Um, there's talk about 120 degrees temperatures in data centers. Do the lasers survive with that? And do these operate? Right. So the um, actually, I think I have a backup slide there. Uh, but yeah, yeah I mean, our, <laughs> our, I was our, giving my slide up while you're answering. <laughs> but I, I think the, the so the la I mean, we have demonstrated that the lasers operate at least you know theoretically up to 150 C. So they, they keep lasing, but you obviously have to look at uh, your reliability budget and your wear out uh, lifetime and so on. Um, the um, it, it comes it comes down to a fundamental uh, you know cooling challenge: how to dissipate the heat. Um, you probably don't want to have the lasers sitting at 120 C for for forever. Um, but again, um, that, that's, a, that's a thermal challenge. We went through that, I you know, kind of share uh, all the details there, but um, you know, having reliable lasers, having some redundancies obviously, and then doing all your you know, homework on the, on the burn-in and, 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 and other things um, is obviously required. But no, I mean, our, our uh, calculations, calculations show that you know, having the integrated has advantages, but again, we're, we're interested in the whole ecosystem. So there will be solutions that have integrated lasers. There'll be other solutions that have an off-trip laser. And I, th I think both both are just, just fine. Again, with the off-trip laser, you have 50% more fibers, right? In, at least in this application, because you have to bring in the laser um, with additional fibers into the system. And there's some downsides to that as well. All right, well, thank you very much. Sure, um, thank you.